Of course, uh, I won't have to comment what you what you said. We we will have a full hour of discussion, so we have plenty of time to discuss. And it's not my job. I'm noticing only one thing, which is the tension between uh, openness and transparency, and uh, the story of the brand, of the quality, and also the implicit social model of having an elite in an ivory tower, and this elite is not, not keen to see the mob uh, 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 sizing the, the field, entering the field. The field is the ivory tower, you know. Do your PhD first, then a candidate to be a professor, then etc. And we will see. Okay, I'm not discussing anything. We are jumping to the panel. The panel will be organized around questions I will ask. We will narrow down the topic. We will narrow it down to Twitter and, and other social media. But that's a way of, of discussing. I will um, ask three times a question. Each panelist will get two minutes for each question. And as you know already, my BlackBerry will ring after two minutes because it's a way of organizing uh, social life. And it's a BlackBerry, and I will show you at the coffee break. It's, it's still alive, but really the end of it. Uh, what's the first question? The first question is really simple. How did you start using Twitter or other social media of this type? And what will miss you if we haven't Twitter of this social media? That's the first question. And we'll go in the same order as the program. Nicolas, Amy, Giuseppe, Bonnie, and George. So I will prepare the ringing, two minutes. Talk. And Anika will give us a start. No, I just wanted to set up the Twitter discussion. Kecce di nuovo. Renzi is not anymore the prime minister. This is new. Huh? What is new in Italy today? We have no prime minister. <laughs> Uh, and then, good luck to get a new one, because nobody has any majority uh, in the two chambers, because we have two chambers in Italy with the same powers. Huh? Good luck, good luck. But uh, at least we, we got rid of the neo-fascists in Aust Austria, so that, that's good to take. Are we ready? Yes. yes. Okay, Nick. Please go. Hello. I'm, uh, I have to hurry because I'm on a tight deadline here. So what compelled, I'll speak on behalf of The Economist, what compelled um, us to join Twitter. So I assume that basically uh, most people in this room, in fact, I'll have a show of hands, who has read any kind of article anywhere in the last 48 hours? Put your hand up. Anyone at all? OK, keep your hand up if you read it off paper. Okay, so still, still a fair few, but the majority are moving over to digital. So as far as we're concerned, um, we think it would be uh, very neglectful if we didn't move our ideas towards the digital world. And um, from our research, what we aim for is what we call the globally progressive in the world, in the English-speaking language. And we assume that there are approximately 72 million people who speak English who we consider globally curious and progressive, and those are the people we're aiming for. And we've really uh, gone in to invest on this. Um, so at the moment, we have an 11-man team, 11 people, constantly working on Twitter and Facebook, queuing that up, because wherever you are, we want to hit you in whatever time zone you're in and give you a chance to read what we're doing and our work. Because what we've realized, I mean, not just us, is that people don't really surf the web anymore in the ways that they're used to. People essentially have about four or five websites that they mingle between in the morning. And we need to be there where you are. And people will go between Twitter, Facebook, uh, maybe their favorite newspaper, which probably isn't us. Um, um, it might be another one. So we have to be on those social channels where we find you, and that's why we had to do it. And I guess one of the other reasons I'm here today is to say that um, if you're an academic, um, 
What because what I did is when I knew I was coming here, I uh, I went and kidnapped one of the science journalists from the science department, and I took him downstairs and bought him a coffee, and I said, "What should I tell academia about how you find the people you want to write about?" And he said, "Well, we get all our papers separately at the start of like every month. We get a huge email. Oh no, with all the papers. Should I finish my sentence? Am I allowed?" Yes, and, uh, but what we really need is a secondary source for our comments because we don't want to just take the word of one researcher. So we're looking for those people who can be our secondary point of research to quote later in the article. So what it's really good for is if academics have that Twitter account or that Facebook page that acts as a kind of um, business card so we can get to know you really quickly and we can find you and uh, we can bring you to the public. Thank you, Nick. And Nick, you see why on Twitter we, we, we are receiving so frequently this message. Sorry, because it's too long, you know. <laughs> Twitter is refusing it. Amy, you, you know the constraint. Two minutes from London School. Start, and I will uh, start the, the clocking myself. So, hello, can you hear me? Not really. No. Okay. It's not started yet. We are not hearing you. Could you yes. okay. remedy yeah. to it? Your, your voice is too low, Amy. OK. Uh, can you hear me now, testing? Uh, he, he, we have the technician checking it. and. Uh, it's a max we can get. OK. So you have to shout in your microphone, Amy. <laughs> ah, like okay. me. OK, how's this? Better. Yeah, yeah better. OK. Great. So I'll, t I'll talk from the perspective of the London School of Economics, where Twitter has been used very much in tandem with the blog posts and the blogs that LSE have used. So, for example, we have uh, blogs about the uh, British political uh, system and the European political system. Um, and the way that academics have used blog posts is to talk about their research and new analysis going on. And that's been very much tied to Twitter. So, um Perhaps it's connecting with journalists and people uh, even at The Economist. Um, perhaps it's connecting with people at think tanks and um, other areas of expertise and, and using Twitter as this online networking space, um, kind of running parallel to the way that you might have a networking space at an event or um, kind of collaborations through, through those areas. So it's very much, it's been a, a very... It's existed in a parallel space um, alongside other activities at the school. Um, and in teaching, I think, um, in teaching, it's, we have a couple of examples of it being used to uh, students kind of live tweeting what's going on in their seminars and their, their um, kind of events. So it's it's very lively space. Um, and I think the, uh, the sort of follow-up question about what you might miss, um, it would be that interaction, definitely. You still have one minute, Amy. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. Um, I mean, I can say a little bit more about the blogs. Um, they've been phenomenally successful. Um, they have about 150,000 unique readers a week. Um, and the, the audience that we have for those, I know there was a question earlier um, in George's presentation there about who, who academics see as their audience. Um, we're able to look at the analytics and, and compare that with Twitter analytics and see exactly who's looking at those blogs and those blog posts. Really international readership, um, people in their 20s and 30s. So, And from reader surveys as well, we know that a lot of PhD students are interested uh, in the content that's put out there. So if you're able to... It, um, sort of for other projects that people have going on, if you're able to look at the analytics and really dive in and, and really get a bit of feedback about who's looking. That's really ah, valuable. game over. Ah, <laughs> but you will come back two times more, right? Eh? Sure. <laughs> pam, pam, pam. Giuseppe. So, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Renzi resigned as well. I'm still digesting the news. And uh, I'm sorry to use a couple of, of seconds for this because there's been quite a lot going on um, last night. So um, coming to Bruegel, uh, why we started to use uh, Twitter? I think that we were, at least in Brussels, one of the first think tanks that started to use Twitter back in 2010. The uh, main driver was uh, probably linked to the fact that uh, being uh, a research institution who has at the core of its mission to impact on policies, 
Twitter was actually not only one of the places to, uh, to ensure that uh, um, our research was simply widespread, but that our research was going to participate the debate, the political debate, the policy debates that were going on on Twitter. And actually 2010 was quite an early adoption uh, to a certain extent when it comes to, to this. So we were quite pioneer on, uh, on experimenting on that. And I have to say that there are some similarities uh, also with, with the London School of Economics, because in parallel to developing our Twitter presence, there was also uh, a different kind of format of presenting the research, which was our, the development of our blog that happened at the same time. So I see some kind of trends on uh, linking up the development of, um, of a strategy on, on, on social media and uh, a, um, targetization or like a, a segmentation of the kind of products that uh, we were publishing in terms of uh, outreach and uh, in terms of uh, um, different kind of, uh, yeah, different kind of format to present the research to reach the right audience, basically. So I think this, this, two, this combination of, of two, so uh, uh, being present in the debate, ensuring to reach the right audience and segment um, the kind of format uh, was key in uh, in starting up the story. Thank you. This could be your best way. Thank you. So uh, now and now, Bonnie, Princess of Edwards. Well, it's funny because I am uh, I am not a think tank. I am not an internationally recognized institution or a major media source. Um, I'm sort of the poster child for an individual academic using Twitter to my own great advantage for my learning, for my research, and for my career. And so I'm, I'm kind of the, the story of you can do it too. Um, I am just a person who actually, when I started using Twitter, was a blogger. I wrote about social media. I wrote about my own life. I wrote about um, identity and parenthood. And then in about 2009, I started uh, doing a little bit of MOOC research um, and went back to do my PhD and was interested in this world of network communication that was happening at, to me and that, that I had been involved in through blogs and wanted to get a sense of how, what this meant for academia, what this meant for what it means to know in this time. And so I started expanding my then reasonably small Twitter network of mostly other writers and a few people in academia to following the people who were doing stuff in my field and having conversations with them. And I ended up with um, you know, a community of collaborators. I ended up with a community from whom I got probably at least half of the reading that I did during my PhD came to me via Twitter because I had this really vibrant, robust community who were reading the stuff that, that I needed to be reading. And it was circulating so much faster than it could have through any institutional channels. And what it gave me the chance to do was sort of be part of a scholarship of abundance, a scholarship for a time of, of knowledge abundance. Um, and it gave me an audience and a presence. So I was a PhD student who started doing keynotes because I was talking, I was researching Twitter. I ended up researching um, how academics use Twitter, very similar to the work that George does in building on the work that George does. Um, but I was also doing, doing work with people in that field who then wanted to share my work and were aware of my work. So it gave me media access and a whole lot of other things. Thank you, Bonnie. I'm very touched because we are also individuals and we are engaged individuals. Eh? And, and we, are, we are putting the, the real content of our spirit in, in what we do. Uh, but now it's George again. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I guess, very similar to Bonnie in that um, I have connected with, or I've started using Twitter to, to connect with uh, with a community of colleagues um, that have helped my my learning and scholarship over time, and I've been on there since 2008. And I came to know about it because I was. Um, editing a book, and one of the authors in that book um, was um, was present on Twitter and was using it in an interesting way. So I kind of started learning by observing that person. Um, 
But what's, what's really interesting to me is how my use of Twitter and other social tools has changed over time. And I, and I feel that's something that we don't talk much about and, and how, um, how different aspects of the cultures that we live in impact our, our use of that tool. So for example, these days I'm more, um, you know, I guess concerned about uh, civility than I was, you know, five years ago, right? And it might be that, um, you know, areas of Twitter were uncivil back then, but I, but it wasn't visible in my timeline, but these days it is. So, or how my participation has changed over time. At the beginning, I was much more, um, I guess, visible and active, but these days, not so much. I, um, I still go on there to, you know, look at the resources that colleagues are posting and interact in, in direct messages with others, but, uh, but I don't post as much these days. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's one of the aspects that I find uh, interesting and, and I tend to question. To make sense of, you know, why am I uh, participating less or why am I changing my participation? And I find that uh, it has little to do with the tool, right? It has little to do with how Twitter has changed over time, but more to do about who's there and what it is that they're saying these days. Thank you, George. The next question is, in your opinion, or your knowledge, how should or could academics use Twitter or, or, or the social media? And does it combine or does it conflict or compete with traditional academic tools? But I will change the rule. We will restart from George, and we will come back to Nicholas. So George, it's you again. Um, how should how should academics use the tool? Um, I don't know. Uh, they, <laughs> I think there's there's great potential there, right? In connecting with colleagues and in keeping up to date with uh, latest developments. Um, in what uh, you know, Nicholas was was saying before, the ways that we participate on the web has changed, right? We we have a little suite of sites that we tend to visit, and and those tend to be our our new site, those tend, which can be a problem. Uh, those tend to be our, um, the sites that we go to stay abreast on, on scholarship. So um, one way that um, I think it's helpful for individuals to consider using Twitter is to <coughs> stay afloat on the latest, um, on the latest research that's disseminated there and on the debates that are happening because I find that scholarship is moving much faster on those platforms than it is on, uh, on traditional outlets. Um, but also seeing how, how society responds to our research, right? I've seen, um, if, if you follow the conversations on, uh, on journals, for example, around educational technology and its impact, it's a much different conversation than the one that you might have on social media with, you know, Tech crunch publishers or posts and uh, and posts from the educational technology industry, right? That type of conversation around educational technology is much different than the type of conversation around educational technology that happens in other outlets. And I think it's significant to keep a pulse on uh, kind of societal conceptions of of our discipline um, and different outlets. So I'll stop there. I'll take that 11 seconds. <laughs> I think that there is an intersection between um, traditional academic practice and networked practice. And that intersection for me is primarily in the sense that both of them are truly reputational economies. And now the terms of how reputation is built in both tend to be different. One um, is obviously more formalized. but. In my PhD research, I looked at the work of Boyer, or Boyer, um, who talked about scholarship in 1990. And he did this fairly seminal piece of research on scholarship and talked about four aspects of scholarship. And there's scholarship of discovery, right, which is the eureka moment, the, the, the piece that's patentable. Um, there's scholarship of integration, 
scholarship of application and scholarship of teaching. And when I looked for three months in depth at the, the, the scholars who were part of my research project, they were engaging in all four of these in their academic Twitter engagement with each other, with the public, in all those ways. It's just that they were doing so in ways that, as George mentioned earlier, weren't always seen as legitimate or even really, I think, legible. To their, to their academic community. Um, so one of the big challenges and one of the differences in that intersection of reputational economy is that when you're on Twitter, you're on there as an identity. And when you're doing sort of your job within an institution, you're performing a role with a particular status, right? And there are other people who have similar status pieces. On Twitter, you've got to carve it all out for yourself, and that can be very threatening for people. And it can be much more individualized when problems occur, so that if you are involved in something that is sort of a call-out culture pylon or dragging, you're, you're going through like a, a very significant kind of personal reputational disaster that is much less likely to happen. I mean, it, it, it does happen in, in institutional settings, but it, it, it is perceived as absolutely terrifying by most, most people. Um, and so how to navigate that and how to understand what those terms of those reputational economies are for another talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, I think that pretty much I agree with Bonnie that the main stake uh, when coming to uh, academics on social media is about engaging, is, a, is about building up the, the, their community and engaging in a discussion. So I, I think it, sometimes I see a lot of uh, scholars that, that they are just starting to use the, um, I mean, fellows, research fellows, they are just starting to use social media to some kind, and they, they, they indeed they are a little bit afraid of, the, of what can get out of it, because indeed it, it is kind of scary, because all of a sudden you are not protected by the whole system of uh, peer reviews and, and so on, you, you throw out uh, uh, opinions, because most of the time are opinions uh, rather than facts, and, and you throw out opinions uh, real time that can be reshared and can be rethought. So this is extremely important to have in mind, but also it shouldn't stop, it shouldn't refrain to actually be fresh, because otherwise what we risk to do, and this is what we are seeing a little bit, especially on more um, in institutional evolution of, uh, of Twitter, uh, one of the main uh, 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 gain out of it is that actually you can engage, and you can engage in a fresh manner. So don't be too much afraid as well, because it's true that things are there and they are written, but things are easily forgotten, unless you are really like running for presidency and you have a photo uh, <laughs> that can be compromising for, uh, for, your, uh, for your campaign or whatever it is. So I, I think that daring, it, it is quite something that is important for academics on Twitter. And, uh, and then think about it, uh, this is a, a, a place to uh, uh, regain certain freedom in order to challenge their ideas and challenge the others' ideas. Thank you. Three seconds left. Good. Uh, Amy. Amy. Hi, just, just checking. You can still hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so how could or should academics use social media and Twitter? I think this is a question sort of before that you have to consider, which is about um, do they want to do it? Do they, do they know why they're doing it as well? There's, there's nothing worse than being told that you should be on Twitter or you should be on LinkedIn or Facebook and feeling that pressure um, when actually you, you don't quite understand the, the reasons why you might want to do it. So I think from my perspective and my role as a social media manager at a university, there's an important job to do around discussing um, case studies or evidence for why, why you should consider doing this in the first place. Um, having an understanding and, and being able to discuss which platforms are best. Is it Twitter? Is it LinkedIn groups? Um, you know, it, is it through YouTube videos, um, and then and then sort of it, sort of going from there really, and thinking about your audience, and and just having a really clear idea of exactly what you want to get out of it, and not just joining for for the sake of of being under pressure from your institution or or under pressure from uh, your publisher or, or or other other academics. I think there's 
you know, there's so much pressure that, that academics and researchers are under at whatever stage of academia you're at, whatever stage of research communication you're at. There's so much pressure, time pressures, other pressures. Um, and social media can, at its worst, feel like one of those other things that you have to do. And often it comes at the bottom of the list. So I think having a, a clear about idea about what you want to get out of it before you even start to think about how to do it better. Um, and, and hopefully that will follow on. Um, in terms of the university, uh, the sort of university atmosphere in the institution, um, senior buy-in is always good if you can get the people at the top uh, understanding about the evidence and the case studies for, for how it can uh, improve things like, uh, you know, or increase citations and download, abstract downloads um, and feed into even things like impact case studies. Um, you know, that, that that's a, a big win as beep, well. Beep. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. I didn't, didn't hear that. Okay. <laughs> a beep, beep, it's clear. But it's my voice because I did forget to connect the BlackBerry and the microphone. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Amy. And we will end with Nick. Hello. Um, so I think the answer to the question is to be organized and extroverted, whether you're uh, operating at a personal level or an institutional level. So um, now two minutes uh, sounds like a very short amount of time when you're on the clock. But in this two minutes that I'm talking, it's likely that over 600 hours of footage will be uploaded to YouTube, which is basically impossible for any human being to keep up with. 600 hours. That means if you try to watch all the YouTube footage that's been uploaded in the time I'm talking, it would take you about 24 days. So you can have, you can, you can have as the FSR does, a very capable cameraman and a very capable uh, video system. But um, unless you have a kind of organized and coordinated and extroverted machine behind that, those things are going to languish. So it's um, important to find the conversations and be part of them. And I think in journalism and academia, that's very true at the moment, because if you neglect the public sphere uh, to the loudest voices, which I think we've seen happen a lot in the last year, then it will just degrade. So we need people who value factual, evidence-based research um, in that public sphere, in the conversations that matter, or they're just going to get taken over by the mob. Um, and uh, I think uh, we all have to be very socially aware, but we also have to be aware that we can't just um, create something we think is brilliant, put it up and expect lots of eyes to find it. Um, maybe the economists can do that because we have 17 million followers. I'm here to, bo <laughs> I'm here to boast as well. Um, but, you know, for an individual, uh, just finding a voice uh, for the first few years is going to be quite an uphill struggle. So um, I, uh, I, I recommend finding the conversations you want to be part of, joining in in a social, polite and uh, empathetic manner. How am I doing on time? 20 seconds. Uh, 20 seconds. Can I give them back to the community? Uh, <laughs> invest and get them back later, maybe. <laughs> That's it. Uh, last question. But by the way, in this area, did you identify or, 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 or test tensions for academics? Of course, George had already said the lecture, but we are restarting well, with Twitter and social media. And are these tensions specific to the use of Twitter and these social media? And what is unexpected by Nick? We will restart from you, Nick. Uh, yeah, well, I think those tensions are always going to exist, but we have to remember that these social platforms um, they weren't built for kind of advanced thinking. They weren't built for analysis, and they don't lend themselves towards analysis. You know, I think um, people go to um, Twitter and Facebook, I mean, let's be honest, to kind of procrastinate and waste time. If you're looking for something specific, um, you go to Google if you're looking for something long to read. So if you're entering those social platforms with a view towards finding people who are going to engage with something that's very thoughtful, very serious, and requires quite a lot of um, concentration and investment. Um, again, it's going to be a kind of an uphill struggle, so you do have to market yourself, and um, I can see why academics would be uncomfortable with that. I mean, you're not salesmen, you're curious people, you know, uh, <laughs> and yet you're in uh, very specific fields. Um, but I think that, that, unfortunately, is the way the world of communication is going. Well, I'm not sure. Unfor unfortunately, it's probably a bit um, too strong, but I think that is the way um, 
the world of communication is going, so it's important to recognize that and strike the right balance. Don't go all one way or another. Don't um, try and jump on every single hashtag and imagine that you'll be trending every single day. That's just not going to happen. Uh, and you're not going to retain your integrity by doing that. Um, but you will, you can find the attention of the right journalists by sticking in your field, building up a good reputation, and being involved in the conversations that are happening in those fields. And the best journalists will find you if you do that. I'm sure of it. How am I doing? Did you notice big differences between Florence School and The Economist regarding the uses of, of this thing? Um, no, well, I think, uh, I think they're both very progressive. In universities in general, it's quite hard to push these things along. If you can imagine in journalism, there's a very sharp economic incentive to jump on the newest Uh, culture of communication. You know, if nobody buys The Economist next year, um, we're all screwed very quickly. <laughs> And uh, we, we know that um, most people, most of our readers are in America, uh, but most Americans don't know we exist. And the Americans that do know we exist think we just write about economics. <laughs> so we need to tell them that we write about absolutely everything. We do book reviews, we do science, uh, we don't just do long essays about economic theory. So. Yes, please. And, uh, and uh, it's very good if we have social media, uh, uh, just showing people our headlines that we're diverse and um, whatever you're interested in, uh, we have something for you, I hope. Thank you, Nick. Amy, the beep beep is for you. Sure. Um, I'd completely agree with Nick about the procrastination uh, element or the, the danger of, of social media being a bit of a time suck for some things. Um, I think from uh, from my perspective as as uh, you know working within the communications division of a university the and and working with academics to to promote their work through social media and blogs, there is this um, sort of negative identity that social media still has. Um, it's 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 tricky because I completely understand that there is this friction or tension between um, needing to have things published in, in recognizable journals and, and going through the, the very traditional routes of getting things out there. But, um, you know, balancing that time with the, as an academic, balancing that time with the time that you're able to give research communication um, in a non-journal sense, so through social media and through blogs, um, can be just as important and, and lead to those um, relationships that, um, that Nick was talking about there in terms of uh, connecting with journalists and, and building up your reputation. There are some great examples of that um, at LSE, but also at other universities around the world and building up your specialism, um, showcasing that. And I, I think for a lot of people, it's really hard, you know, knowing knowing when to stop, knowing when to, to, to for your own health sometimes, just to, to have a bit of time out from the world because the world can be a scary place. Um, and, and Twitter is Twitter is the worst place to, to see the, the worst of the world as, as, as well as the best of it. So um, the, I think the ultimate tension is about time. It's about, yeah, the, ba the balance is tricky and, and no one has that down. No one knowing that nobody has that completely uh, down. It's, it, it's, it's kind of, um, yeah, I, I, th I think that sort of sums it up really. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Giuseppe. <laughs> Sorry, I was unprepared. <laughs> Can you repeat me the question? Sorry, because uh, I, I, I was really... Ah, uh, no, I, won't. Uh, I will not repeat the question. You will get another one. So the, the other question, the supplementary question, Did you notice tensions for academics in the, the use of this uh, media? And uh, are these tensions specific to this media? That's a good question. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, every question from me is good, I know. Uh, I of know. course. <laughs> Did I notice tension? Um, It depends again on the use that they make. So uh, sometimes if they, they push it to the level of really engaging in, in controversial conversations, you, you can get tensions in, uh, in the work. Uh, I don't know if I get it uh, exactly right what you mean by tensions. I mean, if you mean by having conflicts 
within uh, within the, um, the, the 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 among peers on the on the net of you mean by tension something that is tension between being online and continuing their work uh, as academics because that also could be a tension sometimes in the sense that uh, uh, the, the kind of profiling that academics uh, should, uh, should get on Twitter should correspond more or less also to, to the profile that they would like to, to have. So uh, as I said before, it's true that uh, uh, Twitter is a, a place for opinions rather than uh, for uh, long pieces, but on the other hand, we shouldn't uh, forget the importance of being fact-based if you are academics, it, that we don't transform academics into simply opinion makers, you know, because there is also this kind of temptation, I would say, from many uh, professors all of a sudden to uh, use these media as uh, slowly, uh, chameleontically transform themselves into something else that either they think that they are journalists or either they might think that they are actually politicians or opinion makers. And uh, this, I would say, it's the, one of the biggest challenge that, uh, that we could have in, in their behavior. Thank you, Giuseppe. Bum, bum, bum. Bunny. I do think there are tensions. Um, I wanted to sort of counter something that Nicholas said in the sense that I think that networked practice, um, the, the conversational Twitter is actually there. It's not all just about dependent on high visibility and media, although that, that definitely, that world does get opened up. But the conversational Twitter for someone like myself who works at a tiny institution on an island on the edge of North America um, and has, you know, myself and my partner are the only people in my whole town, let alone my institution, who do the work that we do. So I simply would not have the life that I do if it were not for Twitter and for that kind of long tail of being able to find the people interested in the things that you're interested in elsewhere. But the tensions are two. One, for the individual. I've been looking at Walter Ong's work from the 80s on orality and literacy, and in some ways I think Twitter opens up back a world of orality, and Ong, Ong talks about orality as it's participatory, it's situational, it's social, it's formulaic, it's agonistic, meaning it's conflict-based, and it's rhetorical, right? And Twitter re rewards that kind of engagement, whereas academia tends to be interiorized and abstract, and it allows for more innovative thought. And somewhere in navigating that performance, we all have to figure out, right? Right? Where, where are we going to speak? Because you end up saying things that are just kind of casual throwaways, but that are read as if they're your magnum opus thesis. The bigger tension around that is the structure of money behind um, a lot of thought and rhetoric today. And so there, there are things I think we've been seeing, um, particularly in the, in the US and in the North American context, these lists come out which are funded by highly conservative right-wing organizations that are now targeting individual academics whose participation on Twitter they're simply ta they're targeting discourses. They're talking about anti-racism. These are folks who do um, either postmodern theory or critical race theory who are suddenly appearing on these essentially McCarthyist blacklists simply for speaking in public about the work that they do. So these tensions are not just at the individual level but are actually sort of a societal push right now. Thank you, Bunny. We will end with George. Um, so I, I think I've made pretty clear that there, I think there are uh, lots of tensions, as have uh, the rest of my colleagues, but I wanted to touch on um, something that Nick and, and Bonnie said. Um, Nick mentioned that these tools were not built for advanced thinking, and then Bonnie uh, uh, mentioned that Twitter uh, rewards particular things, so I think that's Something that we need to be mindful about, the idea that these tools are not neutral, that they um, reward particular things, that they're built with particular ide ideologies, and that when we adopt them, we might be adopting those ide ideologies and the ways of participation that they uh, promote. Um, and this is easy to do when we consider, or this is easy to understand when we think of Facebook, right? And the algorithm that they have for uh, promoting particular types of discourse or promoting particular uh, types of posts that, um, that attract attention. Um, I think there's a, there's a huge conversation that we can have around 
um, algorithms and around transparency and around you know uh, encouraging colleagues and students to participate online in using tools that shape uh, the ways that they participate and in many ways might expose them to unwanted audiences, right? Um, at the end of uh, what Bonnie said, she mentioned, uh, she mentioned uh, something around, you know, particular groups of people uh, that might be, um, that are essentially on, on lists that are targeted, but we can also consider how you know, when we're encouraging our um, our female colleagues to participate online, what sort of un experiences we might be inviting in their life when, you know, their critical voices in the discourse, right? And what uh, audiences might be on there that might uh, respond uh, to them. So I'll stop there. Thank you, George. Amy, stay with us because now we have one hour discussion with the audience.